Among the highly skilled spies in the KGB was Rudolf Abel. He had a significant role behind the scenes of Operation Barazino. Hammer blows and death blows forced Germany to scatter their resources that in 1944 the Soviets were able to capitalize. Operation Barazino hoodwinked Berlin into believing that a large German armed group was fighting in the Soviet territory. To make this deception more believable, the Soviets set up a special zone where this particular resistance was said to have been taking place. It's more like a drama, a real war movie for the Germans. And the actors were German POWs, all put under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Heinrich Schörhorn, also a POW forced to help the Soviets. The lie was so sweet for the Soviets that Germany responded with Operation Poacher, sending one commando group after another into this bear trap. The Soviet operation might have been impossible without Abel's hand in the act. He trained radio operators so much that NKVD super agent Pavel Sudoplatov described Operation Berezino to be the most successful radio deception game of the war. So as I look back, I grew up with Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, all Spielberg's work. I like his work so much that even today I enjoy watching War Horse and Bridge of Spies. But looking back at how things have been going on for the past few months, watching Bridge of Spies brings a new kind of feelings. And it's all about the whole thing going on with Brittany Griner. In case you are left out, let me bring you up to speed. Brittany was arrested in Russia last February after customs officers found hashish oil in her luggage. She may have pleaded guilty, but the State Department is confident that she had been wrongfully detained. And now that you are brought up to speed, I'd like to say again, Britney's situation gave me a new kind of feeling for Bridge of Spies. I watched it again some days back, but this time I kind of saw something new that I want to make this video. So I want to talk about how FBI found about Rudolf Abel, that they moved for him like an army. And in this scene, you can clearly hear the agent said, We've received information concerning your involvement in espionage. Now, first question, who gave him that information? Quite chilling if you look back how history repeats itself. The United States and the Soviet Union were somewhat like how the United States is with Russia today. As you can see in this scene here, Rudolf Abel was shown with radios. It's clearly something Spielberg threw in as an appeal to reality. Because Abel was good with radio, so good, and for his crowning effort, he was rewarded with the posting every spy wanted. He was sent to spy upon the United States. The path to the great enemy was not straightforward. The KGB provided him a fake passport bearing the name Andrew Coyotes. The real Coyotes was an American citizen born in Lithuania who received a Soviet visit visa. The Soviets used his information seeing as he was always sick. Coyotes actually died while visiting his relatives in Lithuania. His death, in a way, was ensuring for the Soviets. They were confident Abel would not run into Coyotes, or there won't be two Coyotes in the real world. So Abel left for Warsaw at some time in October 1948. There he ditched his Soviet visa, assuming Coyotes' identity as he traveled to Paris through Czechoslovakia and Switzerland. Then he left Europe aboard Aramis Shithia, making his way for North America to fulfill his mission. The gateway for the United States began in Quebec toward Montreal before he crossed the border on November 17, almost a month since he last saw the Leningradsky station in Moscow. Nine days later, he met Soviet agent Joseph Grigulovich, who forged him a draft card and a tax certificate under the name Emil Robert Golfus. Like Coyotes, this Golfus was also a real person, but he died at only 14 months old in 1903. The NKVD managed to acquire his genuine birth certificate at some point before the Second World War. Imagine the danger living at that time. Your birth certificate, your son's birth certificate, your daughter's birth certificate could have been used by the Soviets to spy on your country. 
And that certificate was now in the hands of Rudolf Abel, who received codename Mark. The Soviets had a directive for him. They meant to reactivate a network aimed to smuggle atomic secrets to Russia, American technology smuggled into Russia. And Abel was just the man behind this network. The Soviet government had always remained wary of the Americans' capability. Prior to Germany's surrender, the United States invited Britain into its atomic bomb project. But the two kept the Soviets in the dark. At least not completely as the NKVD managed to siphon vital information from Los Alamos where the Manhattan Project was developing. The knowledge alone proved that Stalin did not trust his allies. However, from the US British, they perhaps chose not to tell Stalin until the first successful test and when Truman finally broke the news at the Potsdam conference, Stalin was said to have shown little surprise. But his composure turned into outrage when Truman authorized the atomic bombs for Japan. We may argue Stalin was anguished. First, he had grand plans for Japan, a country that humiliated Russia in 1905. Had Japan not surrendered and chosen to continue fighting, some of Japan may end up being into the Soviet Union. The Americans had to act. And when Americans act, he came to realize that he lost a lot. The Americans have gained an upper hand. And the Americans didn't have to deploy any army, just used two bombs. It changed everything. He argued the atomic bombs served as a blackmail in the American policy. And he was right. When Truman used them to swiftly end the war, his administration somehow had tamed the Soviet into accepting whatever offers as if they had a choice. And Stalin was not a man to be dogged into submission. He demanded the Soviet scientists to play catch up because in his words, the balance has been destroyed. That cannot be. And from his order came the volunteer network, which Rudolf Abel was told to reactivate. The network came upon after American informants stopped supplying information. There had been a few Americans who turned their back against their own nation for whatever purposes. Lona and Maurice Cohens were devout communists. Theodore Hall had worked in the Manhattan Project, increasingly disillusioned at the prospect that the Americans were building a monopoly of atomic weapons. And he feared about the possibility of a fascist government in the United States. Julius and Ethel Rosenbergs conspired with David Greenglass, Harry Gold, Morton Sobel, and Klaus Fuchs in a spy ring. Fuchs was found to have funneled information pertaining to the Manhattan Project. One by one, investigators worked their way until the Rosenbergs who were arrested, charged and later executed for their spying role. The Rosenberg arrest was painful for Rudolf Abel. It was the very reason why his volunteer network came apart. Because the Soviet assets were scattered away, starting with Lona and Maurice Cohens who were flown to Moscow through Mexico. But at least the Rosenbergs told investigators nothing about Abel. So he was able to continue his mission, perhaps with a new spy network that would later lead to his downfall. Abel's new network took form on October 21st, 1952 upon instruction about a thumbtack on Central Park signpost. It was an innocent gesture for an unsuspecting eyes, but for Abel, the thumbtack served as a vital signal that his assistant had arrived. Reno Heyhannen was conscripted into the NKVD in the early days of the Winter War. He served as an interpreter, later translating documents and interrogating Finnish prisoners. He gained respect through his services as a spy rising through ranks that he too would be stationed in the United States as Eugene Markey. Heihanen spent two years establishing his identity in New York, dealing through dead letter boxes and dead drop locations until the matter came to the hollowed out nickel we see in Bridge of Spies. But the thing with this coin, Heihanen lost it while buying a subway token or maybe newspaper. The coin circulated around New York for months, seven months before ending up in the hands of a newsboy who by accident dropped the nickel and that it broke in half. Inside, there was a photograph with some numbers that became the FBI's biggest mystery. The coin did not lure the feds to Abel who was renting a room on Hicks Street and Fulton Street, two different buildings. While he posed as an artist and a photographer, he had been practicing painting for so long that he became good at it. He also became friends with some artists in New York, all surprised when he publicly admired Isaac Levitan. 
a Russian painter. So despite being a spy, he did have some friends to have a social life. He made up stories about his previous life to them. He lied so much that he was an accountant in Boston and a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest. As far as a secret agent performed, he was good. He was really good. Nobody sniffed anything wrong about him, but the next three years did not go easily for Abel. Everything began in 1954 when Reno Heyhanen was finally his assistant. There was a Soviet agent working at the United Nations. Heyhanen was supposed to deliver espionage reports to this agent, but those reports never arrived. Heyhanen kept himself busy with alcohol. Abel was stuck with him even when they had to visit Bear Mountain Park for a matter of $5,000. It would seem that had been the price of gratitude the Soviets had for a convicted spy. When the Rosenbergs fell, they took along the whole conspiracy ring with them. In that ring was Morton Sobel, a government and a military contractor for General Electric and Reeves Instrument Corporation. He received a 30-year sentence for treason and the Soviets with a gesture of thanks, asked Abel and Heyhanen to bury 5,000 bucks for Helen Levitov, Morton's wife. In 1955, Abel left Heyhanen in charge for the New York operations. He returned to Moscow, resting for six months, and he took the chance to inform the KGB about Heyhanen, expressing his dissatisfaction to have such an assistant. His expression could not have been more accurate because he came back and was horrified to find his network completely in pieces. Hai Hanen neglected everything. He never assumed the task. The dead drops had been left with months old messages. Radio transmission had been sent over and over again from the same location with wrong frequencies. And the KGB had given Hai Hanen a lot of money, all spent on alcohol and hookers. Abel had enough with Heihanen that he demanded Moscow's recall. But instead, Moscow decided to promote Heihanen and that he was ordered to return to the Soviet Union. Heihanen might have been a drunk and a womanizer, but a fool he was not. He knew the extent of this message and how true it is, and that if he were to return, he might have been executed. Growing rather restless, he devised a lie to get away from Abel and the Soviets. He told Abel that the FBI had been on to him, and Abel, unwilling to screw up his work for a moron, told him to leave the United States immediately. He even gave Hai Hanen 200 bucks for travel expenses. Hai Hanen used that money for travel alright, but not to the Soviet Union. He went to Bear Mountain Park to cash out the 5,000 bucks. Then he disappeared with a ship to Paris where he cashed out another 200 bucks from the KGB checkpoint. And he used that money for travel again, but not to Moscow. He instead went straight to the American Embassy in Paris. Once he was there, he sought an asylum and declared himself a KGB officer. The funny thing about that, nobody believed him. The CIA refused to believe this moron because he was drunk until he took out another hollowed out coin in which there was a microfilm hidden within. The embassy held him for a week before taking him back to the United States for the feds. It was at this point Hai Hanan began spilling the beans about the spy network. He was very, very cooperative. He told the feds about his first contact, Mikhail Spirin, who had already left for Moscow. So the feds demanded to know about Spirin's replacement, who was the man codenamed as Mark, none other than Rudolf Abel. Hai Hanen knew everything about Abel's description, rent rooms, everything. But the feds had another question that had been haunting them for years. They had been trying to solve this cipher, but they didn't get anywhere. Now that Hai Hanen was in their clutches, they took the opportunity, and Hai Hanen knew exactly what the cipher meant. He gave a read and he translated. The cipher was actually saying, We congratulate you on a safe arrival. We confirm the receipt of your letter to the address V repeat V and the reading of the letter number one. For organization of cover, we give instructions to transmit to you 3000 in local currency. Consult with us prior to investing in any kind of business, advising the character of business. According to your request, we will transmit the formula for the preparation of soft film and news separately, together with your mother's letter. It is too early to send you the gammas, in cipher short letters, but the longer ones make with insertions. All the data about yourself, place of work address must not be transmitted in one cipher message. 
Transmit insertion separately. The package was delivered to your wife personally. Everything is all right with the family. We wish you success. Greetings from the comrades. Number 1, 3rd of December. Hai Hanan remained with the Feds for a while, and the KGB figured out his defection when he failed to arrive that August. They immediately notified Abel, who however cannot leave the United States. If Hai Hanan had spilled, Abel could not use his other fake identities. Hai Hanan knew about Martin Collins, Emil Golfus, and Andrew Coyotes. Abel was trapped that he had to remain low while the KGB processed two passports, Robert Callan and Vasily Zogol with the help of the Canadian Communist Party. By then, it was already too late. Hai Hanan's information had been so damaging, the feds had gained the upper hand so suddenly, and Abel was arrested, setting up shop that we see in Bridge of Spies. He would be convicted, spared from death sentence, and remain in prison for over four years until the United States had a need for him after losing Francis Gary Powers and Frederick Pryor to the Soviet and East Germany. If not for James Donovan's unbelievable gambit, Abel might have died in the American captivity. Donovan demanded a two-for-one prisoner exchange, Abel for Powers and Pryor. The truth was, the CIA opposed this exchange, believing that Powers had defected to the Soviet Union because his U-2 spy plane had dipped from 65,000 to 34,000 feet before changing course and disappearing completely from radar. And there was a theory that he had revealed everything. So if he's revealed everything, he became worthless to the United States. It was not an equitable trade to the CIA because Abel had told them nothing. Yet trouble was brewing in Paus's family. The CIA had learned that his wife was often drinking and allegedly having affairs. To avoid bad spotlight, they tried keeping Barbara Powers away from the public eye. But this had them worrying about another problem. If the Soviets used Barbara's situation to their favor, then the Soviets may have learned more than they haven't already. Despite the fervent opposition and unwilling support, John F. Kennedy decided to approve the prisoner exchange. The year after his return, he and Barbara divorced because of the infidelity and alcoholism. After remarrying, Powers lived for another 14 years before he died tragically in 1977 involved in a helicopter crash. He was flying the helicopter for KNBC Channel 4 over San Fernando Valley, filming brush fires in Santa Barbara County. The 70s were the decade that ended this story. James Donovan died in 1970. Rudolf Abel died the year after. He was 68 years old and his real identity and country of birth were revealed after death. He was born to Heinrich and Lubov Fischer. Heinrich was German, Lubov, as the name suggested, a Russian. It was said that Heinrich had taught at St. Petersburg Technological Institute, where he got into a twist with Vladimir Lenin. Hmm, small world. He was forced to flee to the United Kingdom in 1901 after offending the Russian monarch. Two years later, in Benwell, the Fishers had a baby they named William August Fisher, who grew up becoming Rudolf Abel. Now, Hai Hanan suffered a more tragic death, believed to be the revenge exacted by the Soviet Union.